And welcome back, everybody, to the Ones Ready Podcast. It's your host, Trent, here with a very special guest. I mean, we have an, an interesting relationship. Like, I think we're friends, but also we hate each other. It's one of those types. Uh, yes, Lance Bello Brajdik. Did I say that right? Or did Bello I? Bello <laughs> I know. It's the J. It's, uh, it's one of my first questions. Uh, so, Lance, uh, I, I want you to tell your story, but do you think that it's an advantage growing up with a name that most people cannot pronounce? Uh, probably in the military. Yes, because you're noticed very quickly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and that can be a terrible thing too. If you look at it that way, cause then they change your name. Cause that's what happened to us. In my well, yeah. Well, we, we all called you B11, right? Right. Yeah. But, that's what, that's what happened to my dad when he, when he joined the military, they did the same thing. They look at his last name. They couldn't pronounce it. And then he immediately got B11. Nice. Yeah, I just think it gives you like a little bit of a superiority complex growing up as a kid. You know, my my name is not near as hard as yours to pronounce, but like mm-hmm. you just grow up thinking everybody's dumb because they can't figure your name out. That's uh, fair. Yeah. 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 I, I did like it later on, especially in ASOC, because we had the operator initials thing. And, you know, everyone's, you know, first letter, whatever last letter. And then people would hop around depending if, you know, there were duplicates or not. And when when I was at, what, the two, the two one? Yeah. yeah, the two one in in Bragg, uh, I changed mine to B one one, and everyone was just you know beside themselves. And so like you can't be <laughs> you can't be a, a number in two le- or a, a number a letter in two numbers. And I was like, well, that's just what it is, and people just let it go. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, I, if you don't mind, introduce yourself a little bit, um, and then uh, we can you know walk down the road to where how you got to where you are now, wearing a shirt sure. that I don't understand. Fair enough. Uh, so I'm Lance Belabradic. Uh I served in the Air Force for, let's see, 13 years, 10 active, 3 guard. Uh, I was in aircraft maintenance first for about four years, then cross-trained into sow T as the first uh, uh, cross-trainee, which was, you know, a story. Uh, and then I did that for about 10 years, or, uh, yeah, about 10 years, and then got out, or seven years, seven years, and got out. I uh, was in the guard uh, up in Austin at uh, Camp Mabry while I was uh, going to school. And uh, then I got an internship, and now I'm here at, at uh, NASA. So I'm my full-time job now is a space flight meteorologist. I work for NASA as a civil servant. Uh, I support uh, space flight uh, meteorology. So anytime we launch a rocket with humans or potential to have humans on it, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm providing the forecast for us to go find them. So really like the PJs. And the Coast Guard that go and rescue these guys, uh, provided they survive the landing, then they will go. Uh, they will go get them. <laughs> I, do so, that, I do that all the way up, and I do that all the way down. It's a lot. That's, a lot to unpack there. It's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, you joined the Air Force. Uh, like I know you have a family. I think you already mentioned your dad in, in the military. Was that one of the reasons that you uh, ended up in the Air Force? Yeah. It not directly. Um, our dad, so our, my dad served 33 years army. Uh, he did, I mean, he started off as a contractor, uh, enlisted. He did, um, he was a uh, service. What's the in between officer and? Oh, a uh, warrant. Warrant officer. There you go. Yeah. So he was a warrant officer for a little bit. Uh, commissioned officer ended up flying, you know, Apaches and longbows, uh, during uh, desert storm and, and, multiple tours in Iraq and all that stuff. So anyway, I grew up in a, in a military family, you know, moved around uh, quite a bit. But, you know, if you would, if you would have asked him if he wants your, because people would ask him, do you want your kids in the military? He's like, if they join the army, I'll throw them through the wall because that's just not a good option. And I was right. like, yeah, it's, it's a terrible option in most cases. You know, do I've something seen pictures better. of your dad. He could do it too. He could do it too. It's, it's an impressive thing. So yeah, that was, that was a factor, but not quite as much. I think when I grew, when I grew up and was finally in uh, community college, my instructors, uh, professors I had knew that I was lacking structure of the military. That, that's just, that's the best way I can describe it. You know, they were just like, like, you could do this, but this isn't you. You know, you don't belong here. You're not ready for this yet. Like, you need to go and, you know, make other decisions. And, and you know, some are like, do you want to, because I had two of them that, that went and said it. And they were like, you, have you considered joining the military? And I was like, yes. And they're like, maybe you should reconsider that. And, you know, I talked to my dad and he was like, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. You know, let's, let's do that. 
And, you know, none of the other options made any sense to me. You know, I looked at, I was a Navy ROTC in high school. Uh, so I liked that stuff, but then I didn't want to be on a boat for, you know, months, years. Yeah. I don't know. That didn't, that didn't, that didn't sound fun to me at all. I mean, Marines, I wasn't a Marine. So that was right out the window, <laughs> you know? Uh, and then army was already obvious too. I wasn't allowed to go in the army. So I really left <laughs> one choice, <laughs> which was the air force. <laughs> right. So I think we just established that the Coast Guard doesn't count. So sorry. Sorry, Coasties. So they count sometimes yeah. <laughs> when it's relevant. So how'd you, how'd you end up in maintenance? You know, I, I think you're a, a pretty smart dude. And I'm not saying sometimes. maintenance folks aren't smart, but I don't think the, the requirements to get into maintenance are that high. No. So we, when I joined, when I went to the recruiter and all that stuff, you take the ASVAB and I got, you know, I, I think I maxed out all the numbers that we could have. So they were like, you can have any job you want. I was like, awesome. Um, so I went in, I think, open electronics. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That sounds right. So I went in open electronics and the first job that popped up was electronic warfare avionics uh, for heavies, uh, which to be fair, it's one of the hardest, at least at the time, it was one of the higher jobs uh, that you could get because you work on all of the systems that keep an aircraft from getting shot down. Right. So you're, you know, your best friends with uh, uh with all the pilots because you know we were trained to work on you know the chaff the jamming systems you know flare um but specifically as it goes to the heavies you don't really jam many things because they fly at you know fifty thousand feet um so you're you're a collection platform so we worked on all the stuff that goes out so that requires a fair bit of stuff because we had at least on the rivet joint we had like 90 systems or so that were in the back Jeez. end of that and you know they ranged from being at the time, you know, an Xbox 360 that some engineer put together and just and made it do something new to, you know, these hardened platforms that have phased array antennas that are, you know, matched and all this stuff. There's processors and things. So we worked on a lot of stuff. It took, you know, about a year and a half to get qualified just on one baseline you know, to fix everything Jeez. inside the aircraft. And then you had three of those on the flight line at the same time. Yeah. Wait, so you never told me all that. You told well, me. Well, no one ever I asked think... me, sir. Yeah, yeah. I think he was, it was like, where'd you come from? And I think you were like, maintenance. You know, like, I wanted yeah, to get out well, of it. Well, it's hard to describe because, I mean, there were, there were a couple of other maintenance guys that came in. I know uh, Captain Self was one of them, and, and he was a maintenance officer, so he understood a lot of that stuff. He and I would, him and I would talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, off at, off at Air Force Base in, you know, central Nebraska isn't, uh, it's not a terrible place to go. It's just, it's, only thing that's there is the rivet joint. You know, I mean, yeah, and the College World Series, if you like, if you like that, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. yeah, it's just not where you wanted to be. Like, how did you end up finding out about Saudi? Like, it was so new. Like, you <laughs> were the first retrainer to come through. Yeah, and then I, I want you to tell the story about because um, I think about it all the time about how much bad information you got before before you entered the pipeline. Oh boy, yeah. So I was I was in uh, ALS up in Offit. Uh, and that's also the same spot where the Air Force Weather Agency is at. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in there and I, I talked to some of the, the security forces folks that were in our, our flight. And they're like, you know, you seem kind of disgruntled, but you also kind of seem like you want to do things, which was it's describing most maintenance and, you know, uh, security mm -hmm. forces folks. And they're like, have you thought about cross training? And I was like, no, not really. So I you know looked into it. And uh, when I filled out my little sheet and submitted it for a uh, for cross training, uh, I had I think some satellite and geospatial job, which no doubt is done by um, uh, uh, Space Force now. Yeah. And so I, I looked at that, and then uh, I had weather, uh, some other job I don't remember, and then the, the fourth one was TACP because I was like, well, that sounds kind of cool. Uh, it's a it's it's a there's something tactical and there's a party, you know, the air is involved, <laughs> and I was like, that sounds great. That sounds like stuff I'd like to do. Um, so I went in for, because I submitted all that stuff, the, uh, whatever the crew field, whoever manages that stuff sent me an email and was like, Hey, um, the air force weather agency is there. So they'll, they'll interview you if you want to go talk to them. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So I went and, and talked to the chief over there, forget his name. Um, and he has my little rip and he was like, we talked, you know, maintenance and some other stuff. And, and he pulled up my rip finally. And he was like, so I noticed you put you know, two jobs here specifically. And he was like at this, you know, our weather job. And then he's like, you put this tech P here at the bottom. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I got, 
I got, it's like, I'm really happy because I have a job that's both of these things. And I was like, well, this sounds great. It's like, it's a mesh, it merged. And I was like, well, that, that sounds kind of cool. He's like, yeah, it's called uh, special operations weather. And he told me a little bit about really like the nineties version of combat weather. Uh, Graver right. Yep. That's essentially what he described. And he's like, yeah, they got cool backpacks. They have, you know, they have cool watches they walk around with and, and, uh, you know, they wear a rucksack and they, so he, I mean, he was essentially describing what I now to know be is the 18th weather squadron. Right. Right. And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. I'd, I'd be down for that. You know, I'll, I'll apply for it. I don't know how any of this stuff works. Uh, so I, I, you know, whatever raised that up in preference or something. And, you know, I put, how, how did I even do that? I don't know how I did it administrative because I don't think it was there yet. They worked it out and, you know, I was, I was immediately roped into this thing. So you know, to the story that you want to hear, um, yeah. I was given a, I was given my, my orders essentially. Um, so when I, when I told my commander that I was, you know, cross training possibly into South T, the, the AFSOC dome, they were like, yeah, you can work your own schedules. Um, you know, whatever shift you want to work, you know, make sure you exercise a whole bunch, check in with us, you know, once, once a week uh, to make sure that you're still alive. Uh, but they're like, you know, good luck. So, I had full support for my commander and my chief. And I was like, well, that's nice. the first time that's ever happened. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, normally it was, it was like, you know, everyone gets the day off and, and like, all right, you know, it's four, it's uh, noon on Friday. You guys get to go home and they're looking at maintenance and they're like, not you guys <laughs> go back to work. So it was just like polar opposite of normal behavior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this so should I have get, told you that like, maybe it wasn't going to be quite the, the cakewalk that you, you were expecting, or maybe well, they just expected you to be right back. I, I don't know. I think, I don't think they knew anything. And I think they were just excited and they were just like, you know, go forth, do great things. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, nice. I, that's, that sounds great. So I get my, I get the rip and it's, you know, the orders and stuff. And it's, it's clearly from the nineties. It's, you know, wear BDUs, leather combat boots, um, you know, Alice rucksack, which we still use, but they were like the dark green one, the olive, olive drab. Yeah. Um, so it goes through this whole list and I'm looking at this thing and I'm talking to our, one of our shop chiefs and I was like, this seems not right. And he was like, well, you know, they're, they're AFSOC. Maybe they, they're just using, cause we were still in BDUs, but this is right as we were transitioning out into ABUs. Yep. And I was like, well, that's weird, but you know, sounds good. I'll just, I'll just do what the orders say. So I get all the stuff I had worn BDUs before and leather boots. So I, I bought a set of combat boots and you know, jungle boots. And I broke those in by, you know, walking around and rucking and, and all that stuff. So, you know, uh, arrival day finally shows up. So I you know, drive down from off it to, um, uh, Medina mm -hmm. and I show up at a building that doesn't exist. Uh, and I'm like, okay, this, this is, this is odd. Um, and I was like, okay. So I called my dad and I was like, what do you, what, what, what do I do? Like I'm, I'm by order say report to this building at this time which was like, I think an evening, uh, on, on Saturday or Sunday. And there's no one there. The building doesn't exist. Yep. He's like, well, um, you should probably, you know, stay at Lackland cause that's right next door. Uh, and then he's like, you just have to go start looking around because there's, there was no other information of where I should go. So I was like, awesome. So, you know, went, went and stayed at Lackland that night. And I was like, well, this, this is a horrible way to start this, this, uh, cross training process, uh, for NDOC. And I go back, I think at like 7 a.m. or 6 a.m., I'm, I'm, I'm at the gate. And I was like, hey, did you I talk to the gate guards? I was like, hey, do you guys know where these AFSOC guys are? You know, look, I'm a South T trainee. And they're like, oh, yes, yeah. so they listed out the command building. So I, you know, get my way in there. I walk around and they're like, I ask a few folks. I was like, yeah, I'm looking for the, the whatever training building it is, the little hut where they have all the, the, yep. the trainees out there. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, it's just right over there. No, no big deal. And I was like, sweet, this, this is, this is really turning out great. So I drive over there and, uh, at the time, Master Sergeant Human was in charge of that. I forget who all the other instructors were. Uh, but I, I, you know, knock on the door and I walk in, all the trainees are out back getting smoked for something. I don't, I don't know why they're just doing, but I think they were learning whatever things we say when we did push ups. I don't, those have, I blacked those things out. So I don't remember. Oh, like the uh, intro to cows. Intro to cows. Yeah. So they yeah. were doing intro to cows and then you have to say things at the end of the cows and that's what they were, were going through. So that was going on outside. And I, of course, walk inside. I'm like, Hey, I'm, you know, Sergeant Bellabradic. And they're like, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? They're like, you're late. So about 10 seconds into that conversation, I was at parade rest getting yelled at by all the instructors 
you know, standing inside there and, you know, no one's listening to anything I'm saying. They're just yelling at me. So finally, Sergeant Human's like, he's like, let me see your orders. You know, great. So he looks at my orders and he's like, he's like, everyone go, go outside. So everyone just <laughs> goes outside under their offices. And he's like, he's like, I'm sorry about that. Um, he's like, everything you just said is actually accurate. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I'm actually impressed that. Yeah, that you made like, it here. He's like, I don't even understand how you got here uh, to, it's like, but he's like, yeah, sorry. He's like, you're going to have to go ca- talk to uh, Captain Schindler, Schneider, yeah. whoever was Schindler. there. Schindler. So I was like, great. This is fantastic. Uh, so, you know, I get back in my truck, I drive back over to the building and uh, I find his office. I, you know, knock on his, he was talking to some British guy um, or British officer. And, you know, I knock on the door. I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And he's like, cool, no big deal. Just, just hang out there for a minute. Uh, I'll, I'll be with you when I'm done with him. And I was like, Aces, sir. Sounds good. So I'm standing there and I see there now in that hallway, there's cool pictures, you know, of all jumping out of planes and stuff. So he, I guess he saw me leaning forward and he screams out into the hallway. You know, I said, you know, stand there, not look at pictures. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so parade rest, you know, standing at the door, you know, folks are walking by like, that's, that's weird, but all right, whatever. So, you know, eventually he leaves. And then two minutes after that, I get brought into the room, you know, standard reporting. And, you know, the first thing he says to me is, you know, do you know how many Southies have graduated my pipeline? It's just like, I, I don't even know how to spell that. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, no. And he was like, zero. And I was like, cool. At the course, at the time, no one graduated it yet. So that was a weird thing to say, but that's how the conversation started. And then, and then he said, you know, it's like, are you ready to take your AFSOC test? And I was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. <laughs> so we we go straight from there. You know, I go, I carry all my crap to the dorms. I throw them, I think, just in the entry foyer on the second floor. I just dump it on the ground, change, and then, you know, run back out. Uh, I think I wore an Air Force PT year because I didn't have any of the stenciled stuff like everyone else did. Yep. Uh, and we drive over, you know, silent, drive in silence all the way over to the pool uh, the PJs are in there getting, getting drowned. Cause that's just all they're doing. They're tied up. They're getting drowned back and forth. And I was like, that's awful. Great. Cool. Uh, and you know, he's, he talks to somebody. So I'm just standing there and, and, um, they clear a lane so they can drown and together in a separate lane. And so then he just stands there. He stands there, crosses his arm. Chucks up the nice watch. I was like, I don't know what's going on here. And eventually he's like, He's like, your time started like two minutes ago. He's like, what are you doing? And I was like, awesome, cool. So I don't know if the time actually started, but I just dove into the water and then started do our, whatever the, the in dock uh, yeah. swim test is. So I did that without a mask, uh, which was uh, horrible. Cause as I later found out li- much later in training, I, I can't close the uh, water valve in my nose. So, oh. so I was drowning. I ingested like two gallons of water while uh, we were going through that. Of course, I didn't know that. And I didn't find that out until I was at CCS, you know, uh, and they would have us flood our mask. And then we do flutter kicks. So we were late for stuff. And I would just drown essentially while we were doing that. You're like, oh, so, you know, I'm going through that. I get that done, uh, get out of the water. We do the run. It's exactly the same. He just stands there. So I just immediately start running. You know, I don't know if I pass anything, but I get through all the calisthenics and stuff and he and he walks over to his truck. I get in and he was like, okay. He's like, all right, you're going over to uh, the induct place. He's like, they're going through intro to calisthenics right now. It's just like, awesome. Sounds great. You know, of course I throw up a bunch of water and all kinds of other, you know, other stuff while we're in the vehicle. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, then I finally get to the instructors and, you know, they're trying to teach me this push up thing. Of course, I'm just blasted. I'm, I basically almost drowned and I've, you know, I did a hundred percent on the test because I didn't have a watch. I didn't have a time. And there was, there were, there were no instructions given of any kind other than <laughs> do the thing that you're supposed to know how to do. So I was like, great. So I'm just exhausted already. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there in the push-up position going up and down. I'm shaking, you know, getting yelled at because I can't, I can't, and I can't hear what they're, what they're trying to tell me, or I can't, uh, I can't process what, whatever it is they want to say. And finally, starting human comes outside. And he's like, he's like, whoa, whoa, there, give, give, give weather a break there. So I, I stand up and go to the back because he's the only one aware that I was, I just went and did an ass sock and came immediately right. straight there. Uh, so the rest of the day, I don't remember. I just was going, you know, through the motions. I had the spare, uh, the spare rucksack uh, that they keep for broken parts and stuff. Yep. 
so I had that and was going you know through all the stuff that day and, and I think at like 2 a.m. that night because now that I've gone through all that stuff I'm staying with Captain Brighting or Lieutenant Brighting at the time some tech started who didn't make the CCT pipeline I'm with those two and I have to label all of the gear everything yeah. has to have my rank and my name and that's when it's a horrible time to have a long last name because that's 11 <laughs> letters that you have to trace and stencil <laughs> on athletic tape on every piece of gear that you own so even yep. your mask which i hated doing it on the mask because it was like it was you know it would cover my face i couldn't even see out of it right you can't put it like at the very top because there's no space your no space your, yours is yeah. like well down the here. mask is only that big and my <laughs> name took up half of it <laughs> so it's like i'm just gonna be blind this is great so it was like at, at 2 a.m finally i'm i'm going through this stuff and i'm just beside myself so i you know i I was like, I, I need to call my dad. So I called my dad again, and uh, I was like, I told him everything that happened. He was like, yeah. It's like, that's it's not a good day. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a fun day. And he's like, okay. And he's like, well, you got a couple choices. And he's like, you can quit. It's like, obviously, you can go talk to your commander, and he'll go sort that stuff out for you, because he's like, obviously, some of that probably wasn't on the level. Um, he's like, or, he's like, you can stay. It's like, that's, that's really it. Those like, those, those are your options. And I was like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. And he's like, I can probably guess which one you're leaning towards. And he's like, it's like, I don't know if you're going to like that though. It's like, you're not going to like, you'll like it today. It's like, but are you going to like that in like a year? And I was like, no, probably not. So, yeah. you know, then I just said, okay, cool. I guess I'll stay and went back to labeling, you know, 40 pieces of gear with Ugh. 17 letters. I think, I think I got done an hour before we started morning, uh, the morning PT stuff. Cause I got it right. done, put everything in the rucksack. I came back into the room. I set it down, climbed up in the bed and I just sat there. And then like the captain's uh, phone went off his alarm. And I was like, cool. No sleep today. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Don't just keep it. this ball rolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was my first day for Inda was, was that? Yeah. Well, I, th I think, uh, you were telling me, when you were at Keesler, that when they were telling you about the job too, like all the information you got, it was like, it's not swim heavy, right? Because the pipeline for us was oh. brand new <laughs> and like all the water confidence stuff was built into the pipeline. So yeah. I just remember like you showing up and being like, yeah, like I didn't think I was going to have to swim, but uh, I'm just not going to quit. So here we yeah. go. Yeah. They, they didn't, well, I mean, they just didn't know anything. You know, everyone I talked to didn't know anything, you know, all the, cause I looked up stuff on, I think on YouTube, and it had a guy with a cool watch wearing BDUs, slow jogging out in the middle of nowhere, which I think was probably one of the Eglin, you know, ranges. Yeah. Um, and he was just like launching a balloon. And I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds kind of cool. He's got a gun. He's got a backpack. He's got some a watch and helium. I'm like, wait, that sounds like a party. Oh, that sounds fun. Like nowhere in there did they, with, does it mention like, yeah, you're going to have to basically be drowned repeatedly and you're going to have to learn how to swim really well. Uh, no, that wasn't mentioned at all. You know, like, I just kind of showed up. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm swimming. I'm doing a lot of swimming. I thought it was just swimming for the test, but we're, we're doing this all the time. Now, luckily, I, I, I had um, at, at Offit when I was there, the, the whoever the guy is that runs the cross-training stuff, or no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the professional development for the base, mm -hmm. he was a prior PJ. So he, had, he had, was a PJ, I think, for a decade, hurt something, broke something, and then he you know became this, this kind of filler job, which we need folks need to good information on. So when I, when I run into him, that was one of the first questions he asked. He's like, you know how to swim? And I was like, I mean, I can, I can not drown. And he was like, that's not a good answer. He's like, let's go to the pool, uh, you know, next, oh, nice. uh, next week. So then that, that first day was wild with him. So he had to get, get into, cause off it had a, the, the, the field house, the field house. It's basically, yeah. it's an old, you know, B-52 hanger that they converted into a gym, which sounds awesome unless it gets hot and then it's not so fun. Uh, but they had a pool inside that, that massive area. And, you know, I got in there and he's like, he, he brought some jet fins, gave me the jet fins. And he's like, yeah, put those on your hand. Kind of like, you know, like you, like when you're like, you're just like a kid and it's just a fin. So he's like, wear the jet fin on your hand. So I put my fingers through the slots and he's like, cool, start doing laps. So, you know, that looks about as awesome as you'd think. It was horrible, <laughs> just straight horrible. <laughs> you know, I'm working all kinds of muscles that probably just didn't need to be worked, but you know, so we would do stuff like that once a week, we would swim. 
I would do the underwater stuff back and forth, you know, and he'd throw stuff at me if I didn't do it right. I mean, he'd just make fun of me if I didn't do it right, too. Uh, but I did that once, you know, once a week with him, I think until I actually PCS, uh, which was, Dang. you know, that's why I didn't die, I think. Um, yeah. And all the water con stuff that we did, because, I mean, I thought I was just doing it because he was a PJ and he was like, yeah, you should know how to swim really well. I mean, I didn't know that that was integral to the pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's just, it's just one of those things that I remember, you know, talking to you about a few things and obviously like, you know, you and I weren't like hanging out and going, getting drinks or anything, but like I, I pick stuff up and anytime someone would like start complaining about stuff, I would just be like, yeah, but Lance over here didn't even know what he was getting himself into and he didn't quit. So I don't know what you're complaining about. And also like, you know, I'm not tall, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's excuses. I was like, I always have like a person I think of like, it, so if someone's like, not tall. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect it to be this hard. I'm like, okay. And you know, like I don't have a lot of sympathy because you know, Bella Bredick over there, he, he made it. So there's no reason why you can't make it. Yeah. Sp speaking to one of those things, like when we were at, when we were at Keesler, all the guys started getting uh, shin splints. And that's mm -hmm. of course, cause we were running twice as much as everyone else was, and, but no one did the math course until you know i think you did yeah um but before that i was at you know in dock and i had jungle boots so when i was there like all i had was shin splints that's that's all i had because there aren't soles in jungle boots <laughs> there's nothing there's no cushion it's it's hard rubber and uh leather and then that's your foot like that's it so when i was there i i had my legs look like i look my legs look like a mummy because i had four sets of of athletics straps that I would have to put on my my legs in the morning before we go Jeez. running because that's all you do in a dock. If you're not standing still PTing, you're running or swimming. That's that's really it. So when I finally got to Keesler and folks started breaking, uh, you know, I didn't realize it. But I was like, oh yeah, I already had shin splints for you know the past year because my legs almost fell apart from that. And then I had to deal with that for six months until you know my orders finally came through at PCS down there. Yeah, then, is this not know, normal? Everybody's legs don't normal. hurt. Yeah. My legs don't hurt. It's like this this feels right. Yeah. Everyone's in pain. That sounds that sounds good. Dude, that's one of those weird things where where <laughs> I didn't I didn't it didn't even cross my mind. You know, like like you might think that your instructors are being uh, uh purposely, you know, hurtful or being dicks on purpose. Mm -hmm. It didn't occur to me that you guys running all the way over to the weather school and then like a half mile or a mile or whatever to chow every day, cold and yeah. then all the way back and then all the way back. Like when I did the math, I was like, holy crap. You guys yeah. are putting in a lot more miles cold. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I felt pretty bad about that. Well, to be fair, we didn't think about it either. Um, <laughs> like, like when I had, you know, uh, what's he? Cullison. Um, yeah. Who else was there? Forgetting all their names. Uh, Hernsrick. Yeah. You had Tim. You had Adam. Adam. Um, you, I don't remember all the names. Uh, Davis. Uh, of course, Davis. Yeah. Uh, Shipley. Well, well, Davis is the one whose legs actually broke. Like He's he went to the dock broke. and they were yeah. like, no, no, these aren't shin splints. Your legs are broken. They're broken. And I was like, David, he's a motivated dude. I'm like, he'll do whatever I say. Like, and I think like tears started to peak out because like someone was forcing him to run on a treadmill after mm -hmm. like he'd come back from the dock and they said, your legs are broken. Yeah. And I was like, something has to be done. I don't know what to do, but I got to do something because Davis, you know, he was a, he was a quality cone, you know? He was. He's very good. Yeah. If you told him to do stuff, he did whatever stuff it was. But yeah, we were, we were, we would run to class every morning. And, you know, that was the other thing. It was, there's only like four of us or five of us, but we're still carrying like three rocks. So it was like, you know, who doesn't get to carry a rock for 20 feet? Cause everyone's just swapping rocks the entire time. Cause all of us have to carry one. Cause we're all on, you know, separate teams, but all going at the same, the same place. And that was, of course, not the same thing as the controllers because there was 20 of them and their oh yeah their schoolhouse was you know a softball throw away just yeah literally the the next building the next a, building. a sidewalk over a sidewalk over yeah you could fall onto it if you wanted to <laughs> and then their chow hall was also just a building away a building away yeah 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 like, not, and then not, that, not the way for us <laughs> well and that's another thing i, I think i have like a, such a soft spot for like especially the first gen south t pipeline guys because of the length of the pipeline and understanding from my perspective, how difficult it was. Like, I know the mistakes that I made and some of the things that happened there. And it's just like, you guys were, we're in the pipeline forever and just getting, getting almost two annihilated. Years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what, what was the hardest part about the pipeline for you? 
boy. Hardest part. Well, the, the administrative stuff was a was a minor setback, let's say, in the on the front end. Right. Um, that wasn't fun to deal with. I mean, I was an NCO at the time, so you know, swallowing a lot of that, going, that's probably not correct. And you know, I'm an NCO, and you probably shouldn't be talking to me like that. But okay, you know, I'm gonna let that slide because I don't fully understand the environment that I'm in. And yeah, so that that part sucked. And we'll place that aside because that's more administrative than it is anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the most challenging school certainly was CCS. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that was, again, this is partially administrative. It wasn't intentional, but we got done with uh, weather school and then we waited for our slots for jump and for SEER and then for CCS. I think CCS waited until you got those other two done. I don't remember. That's what. Okay. So we got scheduled for jump school. We went to jump school. That was fun. I had a great time. Um, then we went to Sear up in Washington, which I think it was, it was like January or December or something. So it was literally snow, the, you know, the, the depth of trees you know, you're walking around in, which is fantastic. Uh, but, you know, did that, get slapped, you know, get drowned a little bit with the helicopter egress stuff. Uh, you don't eat any food, obviously, and you don't exercise for however long it is. Uh, but as soon as we got back from that, straight to combat control school. Like oh. there, there was like two day turnaround. So we eventually flew back and then we drove, uh, drove up there. And of course, you know, combat control school is at essentially sea level for all intents and purposes. It's, it's sea level. Uh, it's hot and it's humid, which is almost the polar opposite of what we were living at, uh, up in Washington. So, you know, we get there, uh, I had Stewie, I had, Templeton. I don't think Templeton went to Sear with us. I don't think he did. But I had Stewie. I think Davis and Shipley had some weird stuff go on, so they didn't quite go through. Cullison was the same. Kraft. I had Kraft with me. That's right. Kraft, Stewart, me. I Cannon. think Templeton. Who? The Cullison, right? And Cullison. I don't know if they were in CCS class. I don't remember. I, I think, think it was just me. I know me and Stewie for certain, and I think Kraft. I think he was a washback. Maybe Templeton was ahead. I think Templeton was ahead. I didn't. Did, I think he was ahead. I can't remember. I can't remember I can't who remember. all. But yeah. you know, we get there, and you know, the the first day you you arrive and you know label all your stuff. Got there ahead of time. Woohoo! That was exciting. Um, you know, met all the all of our officers, which we had half the team was officers and NCOs, which was just a wild team for you know for CCS to start with. Was just and then we had Cap himself, so you know they would just y- yell at him to do stuff, and he would just laugh, and then you know yeah. do whatever he wanted. It was weird because that's like that's my boss in a few years, so I can't exactly be mean to him. But yep. you know, so we we get there, and of course do the the PT assessment in the morning, and you know all of us who were just at Sear and think there was a couple controllers who were in the same boat. Um, our numbers are just trash. Like they're passing, but they're just trash. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, so after that, you shower and you go upstairs to basically be interrogated. And it's a it's a it's it's like an hour of them trying to intimidate you uh, that you're just less than. It's like, I already know that I'm less than. You don't have to <laughs> convince me of this, but OK, <laughs> like, let's do it anyway. So all the instructors are just yelling at us and they're like, because they, they call your name, they read your numbers. And then they're just like, why are they garbage? And you're like, uh, I was at Sear the past month. I'm like. Do I need to explain more? Like I haven't eaten or exercised in a month. Like what? Do you, what do you want me to do? I don't. I don't know the the ass sock training plan for Sear, but I don't. You know, I, this this is what I got. This is what I got. Can't yeah. do anymore. So like that started the weather guys off on a really bad foot because you know not the instructors didn't understand. If they thought about it, they would show just you know a smidgen of grace. They did not. Um, so then that led into, you know, my next experience, which was uh, morning PT. We'd start doing rope climbs because yeah, that's when you climb the, was it a 50 foot rope, 20 foot rope, 30 foot, whatever the, however the height the, the rope is, Yeah, you climb up it. So, you know, we're out there because you're, you're supposed to do your, your rope climbs and then you do your, your pull-ups and then you do your push-ups and then whatever the actual, so that's all your warm-up stuff. Um, yep. So one of the instructors gets up there, he climbs up and down it real quick. And he's like, any questions? And everyone's like, 
like I, I don't know what to say. You just I don't know how to climb ropes. You know that wasn't that wasn't yeah. in, in any of the instruction to this point. Yeah, you so, just levitated up that rope for what we can tell. And I yeah, don't know. essentially that's what it looked like. I mean, he was just up and down. Like it didn't even. It was that quick. It was like fifty feet. Boom, boom. It's like. And we're like, okay, I guess it. I guess it's easy. I mean, that's that's my assumption. After watching this guy, this is going to be easy. Uh, so you know, I'm in the first group because all the officers and NCOs go first. So I climb up the rope and I get to the top, and obviously I'm climbing this thing incorrectly, all arms. You know, no one's taught us how to use our legs. Oh, yep. So I get to the top, and uh, I'm like, this isn't good. <laughs> like I can't come back down, <laughs> or or I can't come down steadily. So, you know, I start coming down a little bit and of course all the instructors are yelling at us or yelling at me because I'm the only one still up there. Um, and then I have to drop because I have no more muscle strength and I burn, you yeah. know, I burn through on my hands. So I only dropped maybe 20 feet. I wasn't that far. I land in the rubbers. I lay there and uh, see Mr. Morello. He was there. He was, I guess, a prior Satie, but he was a civilian instructor for the yep. school. And he looks at my hands and he's like, go see the... Go see the men. So I walk over to them and look at my hands and, you know, it's like, it's not a substantial amount. It's probably a 10th of the skin on my hands has been removed from the ropes, you know, only in the key places like the fingertips and the palm. <laughs> right. um, so I was like, awesome. Uh, so I get that and, you know, they tape my hands up with, with athletic tape because they can't put band-aids on it. It's, they're just going to fall off because it's going to ooze for like three days. Yeah. Um, but, you know, did that and they tape it up and the next morning I have you know, tape on my hands. So the instructors are standing, uh, because again, we're, I don't have to do the rope climbs now because I obviously can't handle the ropes currently, but I still have to do, uh, the pull-ups. So I, you know, I jump on the bar and while I'm hanging there, I forget what instructor's looking at me. He just seen going like this. He's like, cause you know, blood is oozing out of my fingers oh. while I'm holding onto the bar. And this is when I was, you know, I wasn't really counted or checked on my form for the for the ten sevens, whatever those things are called that we yeah. did. You know, I would do my ten and then I would hop off, or do my nine and then I'd hop off because they would just sit there and they didn't say anything because there was blood literally oozing out of my fingertips. And then we get done and they're like, "Go retape the bar." It's like, okay, got it, because you now you can't have blood. On you got blood on my bar. Yeah, you got blood in my bar. So like that was the second thing, and then the third thing is uh, again because of the altitude change, I had eczema which was you know, lingering in my DNA history, uh, break out while I was there. So it just, just gave me a huge rash on the back of my arms and on my chest and on my face that made me want to itch it at every moment of uh, life at that point. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so that was horrible. And that went away mostly through diet. Um, and then like when you go out in the field, it actually was better for some reason. I would stop itching. Uh, so I had those three things kind of working against me. You know, my, my hands had no skin. I had, you know, eczema and then I had just come from, uh, you know, uh, seer school. So my PT was just crap. So you were, you were ready to go. <laughs> I yeah. was as about ready I could, as I could be for combat control school, which well, made that, it that's, horrible. That's it, looking back. It's funny. Cause like you're in theory, the physical progression from the selection course through Kiesler mm -hmm. was supposed to marry up perfectly with the entrance of, of CCS. Right. Yeah. But like, we don't control airborne or seer. There were just like nah. throw-ins, like. You know, the, the controller students of the time would go to one of those schools before mm. uh, they went to Keesler and all yeah. that other stuff. But it's like, oh, no, but like you graduated from Keesler, so you should be right here. It's like, no, no, no. Like no one took into account that I'm going to spend a couple months not doing that stuff. And anyway, good time. So but Keesler was easy, right? We had a good times. I, I would say it was easy, but it was it was straightforward. You yeah, know, there was there was a plan for exercise every morning. The, the three hours of PT. Um, you know, I like the kettlebell stuff. I still use kettlebells today. I mean, that was that was awesome. I still do bike stuff. Of course, no one's shouting heart rate numbers at me too. And that was, you know, that was another wild one. The first time I got on the bike with with uh, uh, Molson and McCormick, you know, I'm sitting there just just pedaling away, and they're yelling numbers. I don't know what any of that that means. No one's no one's told me anything because they didn't provide any information because the rest of the team had already I guess already been there. So I'm sitting there just pedaling away. And they're like, oh, your heart rate's not, you know, 140. And I was like, no one told me what that means. You just can't just shout numbers at me. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm wearing a heart rate monitor. Like, how would I know that? So, you know, they had me go carry the, the whatever, the 100-pound kettlebell up and down the stairs. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was my punishment for not having a high heart rate and also not knowing what, you know, what those numbers meant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
It's like your fault. It's like, okay, got it. Well, gee, and well, and at the time too, like we were like surging students, right? So like the number yeah. of, of combat control students going through there, we'd have like oh, yeah. three teams on deck three at teams. a time. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was chaos, but uh, coming through as an NCO, we get a lot of questions about this, about like coming through a little bit older, you know, not 18 and then expectations and then things that were put on you. For, so from my perspective, I remember, you know, like, some of the guys that you came through with were, were younger, less mature. Mm. And uh, yeah. you made my life easier because I'd just be like, hey, be 11, take care of these guys. And you're like, dude, is this really my... I'm like, yeah, yeah, like, I don't know. Like, I don't want to deal with it. So you deal with it. So what was that experience like for you coming in with, you know, you're not the bare minimum expectation. Like you're an NCO coming through. Yeah. You have to put up with the BS like you're an airman, but also maintain the responsibility and expectations of an NCO at the same time. Yeah, that that was... That was a challenging twist because, like you said, it was it was dual hatting. You have to get yelled at like a cone, um, but then you also have to be an NCO when no one's looking. It's it's a really weird, you know. It's like you have all of the responsibility, but we're also going to punish you like an airman because, well, that's what you are right now. You're essentially no one. Uh, I mean, for me, most of the guys we dealt with because I wasn't dealing with thirty guys like the controllers were. Yeah. Um, you know, I had more patience because I had dealt with, I mean, when I, when I first, when I first got an, uh, uh, staff, uh, a line number for staff and maintenance, and that's very typical for maintenance, you're immediately assigned like seven people. Uh, so I was writing EPRs as a senior airman. I'm going through, you know, learning this stuff. I'm sitting down with our maintenance chief and our maintenance officer learning how, you know, how you're supposed to manage people. Cause I mean, that's, that's how maintenance is. There's not a lot of folks uh, there's a lot of low-level folks. There's a lot of airmen, but there's not a lot of NCOs that want to stick around for that stuff. So they have to educate you immediately. Uh, so when I got to you know the pipeline and I just had four or five guys, you know, it was, it was really easy. And then when I was dealing with you know with the with the control teams, you know, I would do what I saw all my you know all my NCOs do when I was in maintenance. You know, the we'd have the uh, the officer kind of standing at the front, and then I would just kind of be roaming around in the background talking to you know, talking to the airmen, trying to figure out what's going on with them. And most of the time it worked. And, you know, I know I was successful with that because when I got to the two one, um, as a tech sergeant, uh, you know, when I walked into the room, say a quarter of the guys for the team that I was assigned to were guys I went to the pipeline with. So that was, you know, that was one good positive connecting point, but I just was better suited, I think, to just talk to them, you know, because they had questions. I wouldn't, you know, berate them for like, why don't you know how to use DTS? It's like, well, it's because you're an airman and you don't know how to use DTS and it's right. a nightmare and everyone hates it. And you're going to share that the rest of your career, you know? So like, I, oh yeah, no problem. So I just, I just talk to folks and, and walk them through it. And that wasn't the experience, you know, that they got from their, their, their NCOs, because I think a lot of those guys were just imitating the instructors, which that's a good thing. If you're an instructor, you know, yeah. when you're now an NCO, you're, you know, your responsibility is to your guys. And, you know, that, that probably came out the most at SEER. Um, we're up there getting slapped, you know, all that, all that fun stuff, whatever the first intro thing is that you do. And, you know, they turned me around as I'm standing, getting yelled at. And, you know, Davis and Shipley and I think Cullis said they're all pointing at me. And I was like, oh, this is, this is terrible. This is off. This is, we, we forgot all of our training. Like, you guys aren't supposed to be doing that. Uh, but you know the the seer instructors for for their you know for some of the good things that they well, a lot of good stuff that they taught you know they're like you're an NCO your job is your guys they're like that's it like, it's yep. really easy like, your your job is simple and that's when I I couldn't have put that into words prior to that moment I knew that that's what I had already been doing but I didn't know that until they had actually said that to me it's like oh yeah that's what I've been doing this whole time is yeah. you know it's my job is to take care of these dudes and then also hopefully have time to do my job. That's what we did in STTS. That's what we did in combat control school. I had more authority the later in the pipeline. I could actually say things and they would mean things. You know, my, my, my scope of responsibility at Keesler was just making sure they showed up on time. And like we went to class and, you know, and I would have you yell at Cullison when I was tired of yelling at him. So it was a pain. <laughs> I didn't have much authority because I was also a cone, which is another, you know, dynamic, you know, amongst the teams. It's like, you know, the airmen see you, they're like, well, you're, you're doing the same stuff I'm doing. We're the same. It's like, I don't care if you have stuff on your sleeve. Like it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, I had to prove to them that I was, you know, yeah, I was not above them, but I was responsible for them. And, you know, 
that just cost more time and energy on my part because now I'd have to run with that stupid rock longer uh, just to show them. It's like, yeah, I am the same as you, but I'm also not. You know, I have right. other things I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> it helped me out a lot. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, was, it was a crazy time, and it, it's it's weird because like I was, I mean, we were essentially the same rank. Uh, you know, I think we we sewed on not too far apart from each other. So it's, it's always weird yeah. to be in like that weird dynamic. And I'm like learning as a, as an NCO and a human being. And like, yeah. you're kind of going through this experience. Like uh, looking back, it's always weird for me that I'm like, why would I yell at these guys like this? You know, like, but also or throw medicine balls at them. Yeah. Look, okay. We, I made up for that. <laughs> that one time you I did. didn't mean to hit you. Yeah. It, it, it all worked out. Life balanced itself out in the end. Also, you know, who would have guessed my truck would have broken down at the exact spot that it did? So yeah, well, it's because karma was like, "Hey, bro, we need to balance these sheets," and it knows that I hate, I hate being unbalanced. It, it drives same. me nuts. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you you made it through the pipeline. You got your your funny hat. Uh, you were the first uh, uh, retrainee to, <laughs> to make it through the pipeline, and then you moved on to STTS. Was there anything uh, interesting about moving over to Hurlbert? <laughs> STTS had its had its challenges as well. Um, again, limited limited site uh, South Heat presence. You know, folks who had been there for a bit was you know that that eventually trickled down to us because they hadn't gone through the pipeline like we were going through the pipeline, and you know the personalities there wanted to prove that they were supposed to be there. That when they had the ability to inflict their will upon us, which wasn't often. Because uh, we were mostly with the civilian instructors uh, for the the South T guys, um, uh, what Gilbert? Um, I can see his face. The Anderson. Beard. Anderson. Um, when we were with them, didn't wasn't that big a deal. But when we weren't with them, when we were with you know the the military guys, you know they would just find ways to make our lives harder for no reason. You know, instead of coming out and saying like, you guys, here's what you need to be forecasting. Here's how it's supposed to impact the mission. You know, this is what you need to be saying. You need to give me the, so what it's like, they weren't really doing that then, but it was too new. You know, we, we were, again, we were like the first or second class there where they were supposed to be actually doing instruction of that yeah. kind. We kind of had to pick that up mostly from the, uh, the Rangers, which I thought was hilarious. There was a, a Ranger instructor there, uh, who was a civilian. And, you know, people made fun of him because he would just have these wild things. He's like, I don't care if it's attached to your gear or not. He's like, it will be tied down. I was like, keep my pencil. He was like, yes. So, you know, so guys are taking this to heart. They're tying everything down. They're tying a string. It's like, I'm tying a string to the strings. Now that's not going to go anywhere. And we did this as a joke. And he comes out. He's looking over everyone's, you know, kits. And he's like, yeah, that's good. Okay. He goes on the next person. It's like. What the, the most ranger mad. thing ever? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like that's good, that's good, that's good tight stuff right there. I like that. So you know, and then you know, from him, he would he would have these these. If you actually listen to him talk, he just spewed wisdom nonstop. And you know, he's sitting there one day. We're we're going through stuff because I think mostly he dealt with like vehicles or um, you know, kind of low level maintenance and let the military instructors handle the big stuff. And he'd be dealing with something. He's like, man, it'd be nice if you know X happened. And I would sit there and I think about it. I was like. So we should have a weather brief and all the stuff like the con up says. And he's like, yeah, you should do that. It's like, okay, great. That's awesome. No one had told me this to this. I mean, I obviously should have known that, but no one had said, pull out your, your, your manual, go down what the manual says to do. And at the very top, it says intelligence. And the second thing it says is weather or sometimes we're flipping on the manual. Yep. And I was like, okay, I guess we should have something ready. And he was like, yeah, and it actually should be relevant to the route because guess what? The first time we briefed the con up, you know, the ranger guys in the back yelling at us, like, where's your weather brief? Like, what are you guys doing? It's like, oh, uh, cool. I guess that is part of our name, the, the it weather is in our thing. Name, I guess. But, you know, and, and that was a challenge because we're doing all the same stuff that every other, you know, guy there is doing. But then also we have to be in three hours prior to that so that we can do a good forecast for the day yep. and have that for the week, which was, that was, you know, another challenging aspect to kind of relate to, even to our own officers who are on team with us. They're like, well, what are you guys doing? Like you guys are, you know, dragging ass. It's like, well, have you picked up our rucksack? It's like there's a helium bottle in there. It's thirty pounds. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like you realize my rucksack weighs more than every other person's rucksack. We have a hundred and ten pound ruck with us out in the field, and you know that didn't dawn on anyone until, um, I mean, it dawned on us, but it didn't it didn't <laughs> cross it didn't cross beret colors until we're doing an assault zone survey out in one of the ranges and. Um, 
self grabbed the wrong, he grabbed the wrong rucksack. I think he yeah. grabbed crafts because craft is supposed to be going through his, his practical assessment. Um, so everyone's, you know, doing their parts running around and self grabbed it. And he had whatever the 500 foot, whatever it was, the furthest point he had to go set up oh. lights on. So he peeled that thing up and he's like, man, that's a little heavier than normal. All right, whatever. So he just takes off and starts running. So he gets down there. Lo and behold, it's the wrong rucksack and he comes back and they have to sort all that stuff out. Uh, so we're doing the, uh, the team after action report, you know, or uh, it's all the instructors have left us self standing there. And he's like, he's at everyone quiet down. He's like, he's like, he had, I think bar was our other, our other NCO. He's like, bar, go pick up that rucksack. So he picked it up and he was like, Oh my God. He's like, <laughs> he's like, that's all of the Southeast rucksacks. He's like, it weighs 20 to 30 pounds more than every other person's rucksack. Yeah. And, you know, then we had to explain like why it's like, well, because I have a stupid lightning detector that doesn't work. Yeah. You know, I have this 30 pound uh, helium bottle, which actually gets heavier when you use it, because that's how helium works. Science. Um, yeah, science. Uh, and then we just started laying out all the things like I have, you know, the same kit that all you guys have. I still have, you know, sometimes they make us carry lights and shovels and things so, like yeah, there's team all gear. That's, yeah, it's too much gear. Uh, well, and, and none of you guys are like when, when it's time to divvy out team gear, you can't be the guy that's like, hey, uh, Southeast can't take uh, team gear because we already have all this extra weight. Yeah. Like it's just culturally you can't you can't say you can't, no like you can't culturally say that we would just I can't take know, toaster I, batteries like I can't say that in front of everybody no it's like you, you can't handle two batteries it's like <sighs> okay yep so you know that we never had the point was to get to a point I guess where we didn't have to say no because they would know not to ask us right and we eventually got there you know because having 130 or 140 pounds because they're like yeah you're gonna be the the light guy it was like I don't think that's a good idea, sir. I think that's, we should, we should, re, we should re, let's talk, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Let's shove all that stuff into one ruck and then one ruck. see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really what it came down to, but that's, you know, that, that STTS had it, had its challenges, but I think that's where we across the spectrum, you know, from the officers and the, the red hat NCOs and the gray hat NCOs and the old oh, guess me. And then our airmen, um, that's where we kind of like meshed because we were all in obvious pain um, and we were all trying to do things, which, you know, you didn't have enough time to do anyway. Uh, but, you know, that's when people actually started listening and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Your rucksack actually weighs more than mine. Mm, OK, it's like you yeah. need a few hours before the day starts to do your own stuff to have you know things ready for the brief. It's like, yeah, I need time to mm -hmm. go launch a balloon. I need time to take a weather observation. And you, know, you guys need to provide that to me so that we can we can mesh. We well, yeah, it, it's the first time that I think as, as students, you realize you start to see like how the different jobs affect each other and how like if you can't do your job, it's going to affect how I do my job. And also yeah. we're all just going to get smoked if all <laughs> of this isn't done anyway. Yep. So like, let's work together, you know, because mm -hmm. at CCS, there's a little bit of that, but mostly it's just like, hey, let's go out there and survive. And then they're going to gas us and all this other stuff. Yeah, and we're so gonna we're graduate. Gonna get gassed anyway. Yeah, yeah you're, you're still in like cone nug mode where at STTS, you start to like come up, you know, a little bit and look around being like, uh, oh, okay. Mm. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting time too. When you, uh, you, you went through STTS, you graduated, you got to the 10th combat weather squadron. Yeah. And then there was, there was, uh, some cultural things going on, right? Like, uh, the, yeah. all the guys like my generation, that was, uh, uh, interesting. Not all of us had, had gone through any portions of the pipeline. Yeah. Some of us had been yeah. through some portions and then everybody's deployment experience and who they were was really weird. And so like you had all these pipeline guys coming in with this pipeline thing that no one knew anything about. And then yeah. it just like kind of, there was some clashing. Yeah. It, it, it was fleeting on certain teams and it wasn't on others. Uh, <laughs> okay. Like my team gold team, we really didn't have that problem. I think we had one, one time when I guess I, because it, it, it really showed the most when I, I came in late one day for something. I don't know why. Um, so they're like, oh, you, you came in late because we actually PT together in the morning as, as a team. Um, so they're like, all right, we have to do 10 minutes on the, on the, uh, like uh, Jacob's, Jacob's ladder. ladder. Yeah, yeah. Jacob's ladder. And I was like, cool, let's do it. So, you know, I did 10 minutes and, you know, uh, Reed, uh, Tech Sergeant Reed was, He'd come over there and he'd, he'd check the numbers every now and then because you know, he's really into fitness, which was was good. It was a good example for everybody. Um, uh, was it Spillman? He'd, he'd come, poke his head in at it, take off. And, of course, you know, when I got done, my numbers annihilated every other number that had been put up there. So, like, that was the only bout for my team. They're like, 
oh, you're not like us. And it's like, no, we're not like you. You know, even yeah. Stewie, who's, you know, he's a, basically a stick standing in the wind. It's like, even him, I was like, his cardio will put you in the ground. There's no one that I can outrun him on this team. Like, yeah. Not even Templeton can. Even he's a monster. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't know if that's still the case now, but at the time, you know, and then so like for us, that went away really easily. And we could, you know, we meshed our personalities and, and moved forward and had minimal issues. You know, red team with Reisner. Um, I forget who the officer was and blue team with their group, you know, blue team had, I think the first actual group of, of, uh, pipeline graduates and they had, they had some interesting personalities there. Cause the guys that graduated were unique dudes in and of themselves. You know, they were, well, they were kind of lone wolves. Jake show up who's made out yeah. of squares and one of the strongest humans that's ever lived, yeah, you know, like, lived. yeah. And then you have uh, a Matt who was, you know, he was one of those few like 18 year old kids that just goes to the pipeline, puts a smile on his face and you just can't smoke him. You yeah. know, like, so yeah. like he gets on team and people aren't used to his personality. No. It's like, you have to do this. And it, it doesn't seem like he takes it seriously, but he's going to get the yeah. job done no matter what. Yeah. It can be frustrating, but like, you can't, you can't smoke that dude. No, no. And they tried the same thing with, with red red had the most issues with, with the older generation and the newer generation. Like he had Hearns, Rick Collison, um, Oh. Yeah, I ended up on red eventually. Yeah, because when I, they, I came back, they put me on blue, and then I were deployed, and I came back, and they put me on red. Yeah, yeah. So that they had the 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 most obvious, you know, pissing contests with one another. So like, I think Adam and and uh, uh, Cannon came in one day uh, late for something, <laughs> and Reisner's like, "Grab grab a jerry can full of water. We're going we're going for a run." So they're like, obviously, they were challenged at that point. They're like deal so they both grab a jerry can and they're out running reisner on, yeah. on this run and just smoking him and it's like they're carrying you know seven five whatever those those jerry it's five gallons of water they're, yeah. like they're carrying gallons of water of course he did it on a day where units doing you know pt up and down that that strip that road that was right in front of the squadron everybody saw and it. everyone's just watching them just blow right past them and it was like you chose the wrong the wrong application for uh for a strength test because you know, they don't care. Well, that's not the way to do it. Like it was, it was frustrating to me. And this is me complaining yeah. for a little bit. Cause like the, the mindset, it was not, we don't have to prove like we are a different thing. Like these guys went through this pipeline and I was in yeah. a unique position. Cause I got to from Keesler, I kind of got to see a lot of everything. I was like, we have these tools now guys. Like we don't have to prove that we were like worth something. Like we did well deployed. Like if you're not happy with that, that's fine. But like we have these like brand new, shiny, highly capable tools to do whatever yeah. needs to be done. Like, put all that other crap away. Like these guys are awesome. Like everything mm -hmm. that we talked about for years doing like these guys can do it. No problem. And they're going to come back to us and be like, what's next Sarge to so be like, Oh, yeah. they, they can do anything. Yeah, so. and I, I, I know for my team, what, you know, when it, when it eventually you got past that little initial phase of, of where do we fit in the hierarchy? And once we, you know, mesh, which is fairly quickly, you know, they figured out that we were, you know, PT studs that, you weren't going to find a tactical, you know, physical scenario where we were lacking. And we didn't. It's like what we missed and what they all had and what we needed uh, was to take that small amount of time and knowledge we had as weathermen and to apply that to, say, an ODA, to play it, you know, yep. apply it to a boat team, apply it to an RPA mission, apply it to the helicopters and make us actually useful. Yep. And that's what we started to get because we would do our, our weather briefs and they go break out your guardian angel, go to the back. Go right down the list. If you can't answer every single one of those questions about, you know, is it is not impacting your mission, like, then you have failed. You know, so like guys would just pull it out, just go read right through it. And they're like, this is a great brief. This is fantastic. Like, this is what we need. And that's that's for us where we, I think we got, you know, I don't know about the other teams, but, you know, having, having read there, uh, especially, and then I forget some of the other NCOs that were on the team, but they were, they were in the same. You guys had Mario. Yeah, Mario. You, uh, yep. you, had, you had Dave over there for a little bit before he yeah, went Luna, upstairs, Luna right? Was great. Dave was there for a bit. Um, Do you guys have Bryce? Or was I he already? So. There was a an, yeah. an overweight guy. Um, <laughs> forget his name. He got he got medboarded out. I think. Oh, uh, Brad. A, uh, no, not him. But also oh. Brad. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But it was. It was good. Good. What was that? What was the rest of it like? So you you go through the the tenth thing, which was interesting. Uh, I'm assuming did you get a ro you got a rotation out of there, right? Yeah, yeah. We went to we deployed to Afghanistan and boy, what year was that? Thirteen, twelve? I don't know. It's somewhere in there. 
yeah, we, we all went to Afghanistan. I was on the AZRT uh, in Bagram. Uh, that went about as well as it could. Uh, you know, it was the first time we were with them and deployed. You know, that we they that, that they owned us versus you know some other hat thing where it's like well you're temporarily there it's like we belong to them now yeah um, so that was different um, and then I went to uh, Kandahar uh, shortly thereafter uh, I was actually going to send uh, Templeton there uh, since I was the the ranking NCO within the AFSOC side because I think Luna was on task force stuff and I think Reed was somewhere else so I was I was in charge of all the other guys who were floating. Um, so they're like, yeah, we got a spot down in Kandahar with the ODA. And I was like, yeah, I'll go down there for a month. And, you know, because it's brand new, I want to make sure it's going to be a positive place to go. And I went down there and I was just briefing, you know, weather charts, essentially. Uh, so I was like, uh, no, that's that's not for you. You know, Eric, you go. So he took my spot in the ACRT and I stayed down uh, with those guys. And it actually ended up being uh, fun and decent. Uh, but it took a while for us to sort out personalities because they just wanted a guy who was special to read weather. And it was like, you don't need me for that. Just down there. Like like, like Camp Brown in the the jock. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was, he was okay. Yeah. It it got better at the end, but it took a while to, to convince them that I could do other things. I had to bring like my guns in because I brought all my guns with me. I had a beard when I showed up and they're like, (laughs) why do you have a beard? Shave your beard. You know, it's like, cool. You know, so then I'm cleaning, you know, my, my, uh, was it the, the 13, the standalone scar grenade launcher? So I'm out there. Uh, sure. Yeah. Whatever that one is. Um, I brought it in and I'm, I'm cleaning that out. And our, our, uh, the Sergeant major comes in and he's looking at me. He's like, why do you have that? Where'd you get that? And I was like, it's mine. I brought it with me. And he was like, huh. I just like, kind of walked off. And then they started letting me go places with the Rangers and, you know, go visit some of the other teams. So I could go do, you know, a site, uh, a site zone assessments. Yeah, your site weather surveys, whatever those things that we did, terrain assessments. Yeah, I would go do all that stuff and you know document that and bring it in, and that was that was pretty fun. I like that. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's good. You had one of the few good rotations then for some of the guys, or or decent, and then uh, it was decent. Mm-hmm. And then after that is when we did the integration, and you ended up at the the two one, right? Yeah, the two one. That was a that was a good time. That that Just was a question I'm not supposed to ask. No, it, there was a lot going on because. One, we lost weather officers. Yep. They were out the window. Um, most of our senior NCOs either retired or just disappeared. They just left the community. Um, so really, our, our highest ranking person to go rely on like was Reisner because he went to wing. Um, and he was super helpful there. He did a lot of awesome stuff. But, you know, like we were kind of lost because we got up to the 2-1. Um, and they're like, cool, you're on uh, red team. And you'll be doing assault zone surveys. And it was like, okay, when do I do weather training? And they're like, just, you got it. So, you know, so once Brad got there, he took, he took the, the kind of training manager spot for the South Tees. And, you know, him and I are sitting in a briefing with uh, Master Sergeant Ball, who was, he wasn't very helpful. He, he was there by himself for a lot, for a while. Cause I think he went from CCS straight over to them. Yep. Um, and there were no South Tees. So, and he didn't work as a Sati, he worked as a manager. So, you know, his concern was not about anything Sati related. And that's, to be fair, that's exactly how I would be if I had no one to work for. You know, I didn't do the job I was, I was sent there to do, it was doing a different job. Um, so, you know, we're sitting in a meeting talking to the commander and he's looking through our, you know, CFETP, going through all the manuals and all the stuff. I think, yeah, we need uh, three months of, you know, observation, analysis, training. We have three months for forecasting and the different theater that you're forecasting in. Uh, we have to do uh, the avalanche assessment course. We have to do the riverine survey. Um, so I'm just, we're just going through all the stuff, and he's just like, I don't think I want to pay for any of that. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound like what I want you guys to do. Uh, At least he just straight up said it. No, that's, that's nice. I mean, he was just thinking out loud, but that's essentially what he was doing. It's like, yeah, I uh, I don't like that. That doesn't sounds sound expensive. like – that sounds expensive, and it also sounds like you're not going to be on the team that I put you on. You're going to be like your own team. He's like, hey, you're not going to have a team of South Tees. We gave you guys a, a squadron. It's like, well, technically the SOCOM gave us a squadron. You guys didn't give us a squadron, oh. and then you took it. But okay, that's a whole nother, you know, whole nother thing. So like that was challenging, obviously. Um, and we we worked through different things, and we were able to get a team together. Uh, 
which I was eventually put in charge of a team. I've got a civilian, you know, we, we argued for a civilian weather guy to help train. Uh, we got our own room, computers, all that stuff to actually do weather stuff. We, you know, Brad did a whole bunch of stuff on the training side with, with uh, securing like an army facility so we could actually go to a room and practice like weather academics, which is what you're supposed to do for our, uh, what are those two tests? The diagnostic and the uh, verification. The, yeah, the diagnostic and verification standout right. that we would go through. Yep. Um, so we had to like, you couldn't just take the test. You had to train for the test, then take the test and then fix your deficiencies. And then you do your thing before you deploy. Mm -hmm. and we'd have a whole list of things and like explaining it to the team leaders was, you know, some would get it and some wouldn't because, you know, some of them we went through training with and they got it. Guys who went through training with went to these units where they didn't have Southeast. So they're like, they don't need to worry about that stuff. They're, they're fine. You know? So it, it, and that took, you know, like a deployment to convince, you know, when I went to Germany and was running the guys in Africa and Afghanistan and wherever, wherever else they were, um, you know, the captain is finally, you know, cause initially we were confrontational on the deployment cause I had a plan for my guys and he had a plan for my guys and they didn't sink at all. Um, weird. It's just, which is weird. Right. Um, and by the end of it, you know, he's sitting behind me looking at what I'm doing. He's like, Oh, you're doing what I'm doing, but you're doing it for your guys. And I was like, yeah, like that's exactly what I'm doing. Like I have guys in Africa, I'm providing forecasts for them. I'm sending them RPA platforms. You know, I'm doing all the things that an officer in my position would do, but I'm just an NCO and I have to do all these things because they need it to do the job that they're supposed to be doing. And I did the same thing for you know, guys in Afghanistan and our one guy who was kind of floating around Syria doing whatever, um, stuff doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, I like that part of it. So when I got back at the end of the second or third deployment there at the two one before I got out, uh, you know, it, it ended where I wanted it to end. You know, all the guys that I had, I had trained to deploy went and did the thing that they were supposed to do by our doctrine, by our, you know, our mission set. And, you know, they had good deployments. They did a lot of awesome stuff. And plus yeah. I got to sit in Germany for, you know, six months, which was fantastic. And then, then I went to Africa and it's a wild stuff there too, which was pretty cool. Uh, well, but it was I good. Think, I think culturally it was hard because like, so working with the army, it makes sense why they wouldn't understand us because there's so many of them, yeah. you know, like and the, the, the special operations group or whatever the, the, special forces groups would rotate and they don't always get the same package when they go through. And so like, it, it can be frustrating, but like for years we worked for USASOC basically. Yeah. And so like, if you were a controller and you attached to an ODA, like you didn't see a lot of the, what we were doing was in the background. And so like mm -hmm. when we came into the foreground and we're like, Hey, this is what yeah. we're doing. they're like, why we never had this before. It's like, no, 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 yeah. you always had this. Yes. It just wasn't with you. You know, so like you didn't notice it. Yeah, it was there. Yeah. And so and it wasn't always, you know, at the fob with you. It wasn't always, you know, in the same room as you. It's just uh it was it's a different thing. So there's uh, some growing pains and all that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of growing pains and yeah. Some got it, <laughs> some didn't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean I when I was at the two three, I remember <clears throat> a captain coming over to me and be like, Hey Trent, and he sat down and he's like, Explain this weather thing to me. I explained it to him and I'm like, here's like the, the it's just like you guys, like, uh, like, you know, if we're not good at weather, because like, he had weather guys on his team, he's like, yeah. what do I do with these guys? I'm like, they got to be good at weather. Otherwise, yeah. like, they have no reason to be anywhere yep. if they can't do that. Like, it, the, all this, like, shooting and door kicking and all this other stuff, like, that's good. Mm. But if you're not good at weather, then what are you even there for? Yeah. And he's like, oh, okay. So, like, I drew him the circle of, like, you know, operational mm -hmm. relevancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, oh, okay, I got it, you know, threw his giant dip in and, and walked yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, that's that would have been nice if, if folks had approached us like that at, at the at the two one. They they did not have that that uh, well, they didn't have that approach. They we had to go the hard way, um, yeah. and I had to you know because we with that same captain who was with me in in Germany, um, one of our one of our guys, Andrew uh, Roque, he I think he broke his finger when he was in Africa, so he had to get sent up to. To Germany to get looked at. And then I'm, you know, I talked to the captain. I was like, let's just keep him here. He can help me do other stuff for a bit and see what I'm doing. And then we can send him back because he can't do anything with, with a, with a broken finger. Like you can't lift stuff. Like you're useless. You can't do anything. Yeah. Um, so I, I brought him up there and I was having him help me provide the forecast. I would do a zone forecast for each of our, our guys and then send some of some other Intel stuff and stuff I found and things that were useful. But I had him try to build one with me and the, our office was small. You know, it's not like, 
you know, the captain was, you know, maybe, you know, a, a phone book throw away. Um, and while, while I'm yelling at, at Andrew, not like, oh my, not in a negative way, I'm constructively criticizing him. I'm like, why don't you know how upper, like how jet streams work? Like, how have you forgotten the names of the jet streams? Like, this is basic, you know, military meteorology. This is 101 stuff. So I said that probably, I think, 17 times, you know, of course, over a day about something. And each time I say it, you know, the captain kind of leans over, he squints, and he goes back go back to typing. So at the end of the day, he he we had two other uh, captain and, a, and another NCO in there, one for Intel, one for the uh, Armory. So he's like, you guys just take a break for like 10 minutes. So they, they walk out and he pulls his little chair over and he sits next to us. And he's like, he's like, Andrew, he's like, when I asked you when we were back, you know, stateside, if you were prepared, qualified and trained to do your job, you said yes. And I asked that probably two or three times. And you said yes. And he was like, Roger. And he's like, I'm not getting the feeling that you're trained, qualified or prepared to do the thing that you're supposed to do. It's like based off of what B is saying, you know, repeatedly. And he's, and he, and he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, I've known B a long time. Um, it's like, you've caused tension here because I was under the impression that you knew what you were doing and could do the job that you're trained supposed to be doing. He's like, you're not. <laughs> it's like, obviously. Yeah. He's like, you not saying that. And he's like, he's like, that's partially on me. I didn't know it better. It's like, but you've helped create a problem between him and I, because I was trying to fight to keep you guys on my team and not with the Southeast because you told me you were trained. So he got it at the end, you know, he got, it's like, Oh, you guys need to spend like six months doing this stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah it takes time. It's like, we don't, it's a soft skill. You know, if I don't sit and forecast, especially for tropical weather, mountain weather, oh. mid latitude weather, ocean weather, marine weather, it's just, they're all different things function different things even go this different directions sometimes you know what season is it a monsoon season those are things you have to know uh, especially you know how to forecast and you know like he didn't grasp all that stuff he just was like you guys need to spend time forecasting it's like yeah we do and, yep. you know at the end of it he was he was brought to the light and saw you know that you know south tees were important and we had a unique mission and we needed to be have time to train to do that mission surprisingly yeah crazy Mm -hmm. yeah, it, was, it was a different. I, I still do think, though, that I could probably whip out a forecast for anywhere in Afghanistan at any given That's time. Good. That'd be That's pretty, good. you know, but like that, like you said, though, it's a, you have to have like a, a well of experience to, <laughs> to do these things. So you ended up at NASA. How did yeah. you? So, OK, so like, let's just walk guard and then NASA. Like, how did all right. this happen? So I as I got out, well, as I was at the two one, I decided that. I wasn't going to stay in South T any longer. I was like, I've I had cried. enough. I'm, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go to do other things. Um, maybe they'll fix things and I can come back, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, so I was like, I, I'm going to get out. Uh, so I got out, moved back home and uh, went to Texas A&M um, and got my bachelor's in meteorology and my master's in oceanography uh, while I was there. So all the fluids of the atmosphere and the ocean, that's, that's what I do now. I get, I get all the fluids. Um, uh, while I was in my master's program, I uh, got, well, back up. So I, so I got out of the military in, in 16, off of active duty, joined the guard. And then while I was in community college, retaking uh, physics, because my physics had expired from a decade earlier from when I was in uh, community college then, I had to take it again. And also, I was like, I don't know how to be a student, like a right. good academic student anymore. Um, I need to learn, learn, go learn how to do that again. So I took like... Calculus, physics, chemistry, uh, uh, both sets of those back to back. And while I was in there, I found a community college program for NASA. Um, and it was, I forget what it's called, NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars. That sounds right. Um, and all you did essentially is you you applied to this program. I got into it because I was a veteran, you know, with the five point um, uh, preference and all that stuff that you get or 10 point, depending on where, whatever you're at. I got into that program and essentially just learned about NASA and what they're doing. So we're going to Mars, we're going to the moon, we make rockets, uh, we have the space station. Um, so I learned about that and then I got to go on site actually here at Johnson Space Center where I'm at now. And I got to see the NBL, which is the pool, the massive pool where they can actually create waves, which is kind of wild. Uh, but that's also where the space station's at. So they have all the modules of the space station buried, on, not buried, deep in the water. Uh, and it's like 50 foot pool, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but the astronauts get to go learn how to work 
on the space station because they can actually crawl around in a somewhat buoyant, like they neutralize their buoyancy with weights and they'll take them around and divers will, you know, have them in their little dot in their space suit and they move them around so they can work out procedures to, you know, crawl out of the space station to go to X spot and then fix it. Because that's mostly what they do is they just fix the space station. Uh, it's like 80% of their work because it, it's in space and it breaks all the time. But it's in space, so it's not like you can just fix it. So astronauts are mostly maintenance. On the space station, yeah. It's mostly okay. maintenance, which is kind of right. wild. Yeah, yeah, that's mostly what they fix. Granted, right. they spend the rest of their time uh, doing uh, scientific experiments and stuff. Because uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do in zero G or close to zero G, which is where the space station's at that you can't do here. Uh, right. But other than that, it's fixing the space station. Uh, so I went and saw all that stuff, and then I went back to the community college stuff and then got accepted at AM. So I went up there. And then when I was in my master's program, um, I was like, Yeah, I think I want to work at NASA. That's like I was there. I was happy when I was there. You know, people weren't like yelling at me. Um, it's like, I, I want to go look into that. So I, I got on LinkedIn. I reached out to a couple. Uh, you know, I typed in like NASA meteorologist, and it was like four people. Now there's five because I'm, I'm now in that group too. Um, and I just shot a note to one of them, uh, a lady that works down in uh, Kennedy Space Center out in Florida where the, uh, the launch pads are at for they actually launch the rockets. And I was like, how do I become like you? How do I, how do I get a job as a meteorologist at NASA? And she was like, yeah, cool. You know, I, I called her and she laid out a few different things. But basically it was you need an internship called the Pathways Program, uh, which is a government uh, internship program for, so specifically for NASA it was a NASA pathways. So I got into that program, um, by applying to it, uh, for the next round of stuff that they came out, because uh, most of it's for engineers. I have an engineering, uh, bachelor's and then, um, meteorology bachelor's and, and, a, uh, oceanography master's as I was working on, on the last two uh, at the time, but I got accepted into that and I got an internship to go down to the Kennedy space center for, uh, a semester. I got to, you know, I got to work on the Artemis uh, capsule. Mostly they put me with the environmental control system, which is like the air conditioning unit for the space station. So they're like, well, that's, that's weather, right? That's, that's what, that's like, there's it's pressure. Atmospheric. That's yeah. atmospheric, right. That makes sense. And of course it's not at all the same thing, but okay. They didn't know what to do with me. But while I was there, I was able to go work with the, uh, the, the, the same ladies that I talked to, uh, you know, months prior or almost a year prior, I was able to work with them. And I got to, you know, see how weather as a, as a meteorologist and a forecaster was actually you know, overlaid on top of rocket missions, uh, the capsules and returns. So that, that, that internship led to, uh, you know, working there. I got to work at Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Um, and that's where most of the, the loading is done. So when they have a rocket and it goes, you know, super fast, super high, um, you have to determine all the loads that impact the rocket. So it doesn't like rip apart. Um, right. and that's where a lot of that's done. Um, and then I, interned here at Johnson Space Center with the one guy that, that uh, I'm still working with now. Um, and he does all the forecasting, mostly for the search and rescue, but for the rocket and not just, uh, it's for the whole world, which is kind of hard to imagine. So the rocket obviously flies around the whole world. So we essentially provide a forecast for the entire planet uh, for one pass. Uh, and that's the atmosphere and the ocean because you don't want a capsule, say, to have an abort they'll ditch the capsule and they'll, or they'll ditch the rocket and then land into the ocean and they can't land in a thunderstorm. They can't land in, yeah. you know, 10 foot waves because then they can't be rescued and also they'll drown. Um, and then it's the same thing coming down whenever they go actually land. Um, so like yesterday we just did uh, the SpaceX mission, uh, cargo. So they landed their, uh, their capsule off the coast of Florida. Uh, there's no humans in it. So the stakes are a lot lower. Um, but we do all the same forecasting and recovery stuff that we do so they can go rescue astronauts and there's not, you know, a lost capsule, lost parachutes because they have to go recover all that crap. Um, so I worked with him and did that for a little bit. And then, you know, after I think like the first week I was here, the flight directors who I work for, uh, they walked in and they're like, you want a job here? And I was like, obviously, that's the whole point of the internships to get a job. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but, you know, they, they recognized uh, that, you know, it's really hard to find someone who knows all the things that you need to know to do space flight meteorology. You essentially have to be a military forecaster. You have to have a good, you know, university as far as meteorology goes and AM's is a very good one. Right. And then you have to know how to apply that knowledge you know, to mission sets. And it's like, that's almost no one. There's almost no one who has those skill sets. 
who is willing to change jobs and do all that stuff. So I just kind of showed up as a miracle, essentially, is the way they describe it. And they're like, yeah, uh, it was weird. They've been trying to hire someone for like a decade. Couldn't find anyone because it's challenging. Folks would show up and be like, this is really cool. I'm like, this is really hard. I'm going to go. <laughs> and then they'd leave. So it'd just be the same guy again by himself for a decade. Um, and then, yeah, I showed up and they, they hired me instantly. So now I'm, now I'm here. I graduated in 21 um, from all the schooling, which I think that's all I'm going to do. I don't want to go to school anymore. Um, <laughs> that was and, enough. Yeah, that's enough. Well, it's, yeah, five years straight when you're in your 30s is not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right. Plus, it, it kind of dents money making because you don't exactly make a ton of money as a full time student uh, right. either. Yeah. So that was that was another you know challenging uh, aspect to it. But yeah, now I'm now I'm here. I work. You know, all the time uh, I support you know NASA. So we, we did the Artemis one mission to the moon. Like I was forecasting for that. We, we provided the forecast for uh, where they were going to land. Uh, and they took that so they could go land a capsule and go pick it up and then not be destroyed. Yeah. Uh, we support uh, Boeing and we support obviously SpaceX with all their stuff. That's wild, man. Yeah. That's weird. It's pretty crazy. That one guy was probably so tired. Like you showed up and he's like, you can actually do this job. Like, Oh my goodness. Well, now he can take like vacation, yeah, which is baffling because prior to me being here, he almost couldn't. And was like, well, what if he got sick? And it's like, he wasn't allowed to get sick. <laughs> like, that's like, I don't, well, I don't understand like, what you're saying. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Most of what I do is code because he has a bunch of programs and stuff, you know, that pulls data from all the weather models that we use. Um, but it's all like Fortran. So it's like, you know, very early coding language. And now all the stuff I'm doing is Python, which is what I was taught at A&M. So I'm converting all his stuff to modern stuff and then making it, you know, more reliable, more useful, quicker. So instead of coming in 12 hours before a capsule landing or a rocket launch, we can come in like four hours and oh, nice. then do our assessment and then, you know, then go home and, you know, go do other stuff. Jeez, dude, well, yeah. th that is, that is awesome. I was super excited to get you on the podcast because, you know, we have a little bit of shared experience and, and oh, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful that the, the universe you know, worked it out so that you're not still thinking about murdering me in my sleep because of the medicine ball incident. Not you so know? much anymore. It's yeah. Past. Yeah. Hopefully we, we made it past that. Uh, two more things real quick. I want okay. you to explain your shirt to people. Uh, if you can't, if you're just listening, it says, do you even parcel lift? Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is a, a nerd weather meteorology uh, shirt. Uh, so parcels, that's what we define things in the atmosphere. Uh, and when you when you have a parcel that lifts, typically that's in relation to convection. That's where thunderstorms and things come from. Um, that's that's what it's tying it to. So you know, and then it's also just cool because to even lift is you know that's just a common colloquial that you see around. So parcel lift is just the perfect mesh of both, you know, awesome lifting shirt slash weather nerd, and then you no know, one gets it, so it's even better. Yeah, you're like I go to the gym, and not only am I stronger than you, but I am smarter nerdier than you as well it's both so yeah. it's, it's the it's big a double thing. put down yeah <laughs> i'd expect nothing less from you um last thing is we we usually ask all of our des our guests um our, our demographic like we're, we're doing the podcast for people interested in getting into the uh mm -hmm. the community obviously like the sauti thing doesn't exist the way it did before uh, yeah. but i think your experience more than qualifies you to give advice so if you could give uh you know one or or your best piece of advice to somebody that's considering joining the, the Air Force Special Warfare community, what would it be? Uh, the easiest one is if you feel called to go into AFSOC or what do they call it now? Special Tactics? Yeah, um, all, the, all that stuff. Air all Force that stuff. Special if Warfare. You, special Warfare. Okay, so if you feel called to go into it, then go into it. Uh, that's it. I mean, that's just the easiest one is if you feel called to do it, do it. Not doing it and living in regret is a way worse uh, position to be in versus the alternative of just trying and going and doing it. And then, yeah, you know, times are hard, but life is hard. So just suck it up. There it is. Hey, man, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, for bales out there, uh, like, subscribe, yada, 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 and we will catch you next time uh, out here.